very good evening and a warm welcome to Personal Finance. I'm Kukule Tukele. Well, purchasing your first property may be daunting enough to either purchase the first place that falls within your price range or to continue renting. Graham Knight from Alexander Forbes joins me now for advice on purchasing your first home. Graham, good to have you with us this evening. This is a huge deal for many South Africans' lives, yeah, uh, so. moving from that transition between leaving the parents or leaving the renting uh, apartment and actually purchasing your first home. Mm. The key pitfalls and mistakes that individuals often make? I think a lot of people rush into buying a property. They possibly haven't checked the correct location. They haven't checked the affordability of whether they can actually afford to buy a property. Mm -hmm. So they may get their hopes up by looking at something that's completely unaffordable. Other things they don't take into account is the interest rates, whether that increases over the next 20 years or not, because it's not a fixed cost for the next 20 years. Mm. Um, maintenance, there's a lot of other costs associated with buying your first house as opposed to renting from somewhere. So yeah, there's a lot that people need to consider before they decide to go and buy by their first place. Let's get into that interest rate issue because obviously it varies according to the person's uh, credit uh, standing. So it's either s uh, s considerably higher than what the current repo rate is or maybe just marginally. Yeah. But to fix or not to fix, is that the question when it comes to interest rates? It's a d that's a difficult one because if you, you can only fix it for, for two or three years, the banks mm. allow. So to fix it now, we're not too sure if interest rates will go up by two or three percent. Because generally if you fix your interest rate, it's higher than, your, than a variable rate. So if you fix it now and interest rates don't go up, then you're paying 2 or 3% more than you should be. Mm -hmm. But obviously if they do go up 4%, then you save the 2%. So it's quite a difficult, a difficult decision to make. But generally with interest rates on a rising cycle like they will be in the future, it's something to definitely consider. Because at least you can fix your cost for two years. But not any longer. No, you can't fix it for 20 years. Let's go into that affordability uh, matter that you just brought up a moment ago. Everybody wants the best quality that they can afford. Yeah. And that's a standard as when it comes <laughs> to the human race. Keep up overall. with the Joneses. Yeah. Exactly. But when it comes to affordability, what kind of budget or, or, or split should individuals have? If you know that you can afford a bond of about eight to 10,000 Rand a month, then how should you distribute that according to all the various uh, other costs that come into owning well, that, a home? Yeah, that's always the, they normally look at about a third of your income after tax that you should be spending on a property. Mm. But what people forget is that there's levy, uh, not, yeah, there's levies if you buy in a sectional title, there's rates and taxes, there's homeowners insurance, there's other insurance, there's possibly security costs, there's maintenance of your property. So if you're earning 30,000 and you say, oh, well, I can afford a bond of 10, that's not the only cost that you actually need to look into. How do then uh, South Africans go about in receiving advice for this? Because how it usually happens is that you go out onto the market, you look for that home, the salesperson gives you a nice uh, yes. a discussion, uh, and then the financing gets approved, and then you get slammed with all the other surprise costs at the end of the day. Yeah, so the, the banks recently have been quite stringent on their affordability calculations, which is probably a good thing because people end up not exposing themselves to too much risk. Mm -hmm. um, but the... You just need to do a proper budget. You need to look at, look, do your homework first, look into all those other costs, get, get quotes, get prices, ask your friends who've bought property before mm -hmm. so that you're not jumping into this big bad hole, you know, not knowing what, you, what to expect. It's interesting you make mention of the banks as well as uh, how they've become quite strict on their qualification criteria. As uh, uh, a prospect homeowner or someone who wants to purchase another home, are there any kind of discrepancies or additional savings that you can have in place? If you don't get 100% bond approval, where yeah, do I fork out the other 10 or 20%? That's, that's the problem. The banks aren't giving 100% bonds just to anybody these days. Mm. So you need to try and save money firsthand before you can, can go and purchase that property. Um, the best part is probably a money market or some sort of stable investment like a unit trust that you could s try and save up a deposit. Inflation beating obviously. Yes, yeah. But you don't want to be too risky with it because if the market drops off the month before you need to buy that property, mm. then you may lose some of your value. So it needs to be quite a stable investment, but yeah, to, you need to beat inflation obviously. And on the deposit, uh, are we looking at 10%, 20%? It, it ranges. I've, I've heard people paying 20%. I had to pay 20% myself, but that's a which was huge terrible. Sum. Yeah. Let's say you're purchasing a home of 800000 That's quite yeah, a bit of money yeah. that you need to We were quite up. lucky that my wife had inherited a property, so we sold that to get the deposit. But mm. just to save up 100 and something thousand rand is, is a lot of money. Mm. Um, some of the banks are asking for 10%, which is still a vast amount of money, bearing in mind that you still need to move into that house. Furnish it? Furnish it, probably redo the carpets, repaints, fix the odd broken window, 
and make it your own, which is another, another 10 or 20% that you're going to be paying. Maybe if you can share some insights uh, when you speak to some of your clients as to uh, the models and the plans that they have in place uh, before taking on that major purchase. A lot of them have got a sort of a five-year plan. So, okay, we're going to buy property in 2020. So let's start saving now, trying to do a forecast of what a house would cost in 2020 because mm. that's obviously it's going to be more than, than it is t today. And then, yeah, you just need to plan, plan ahead. You need to try and then rent a place that's not too expensive so you can save some of your money and then, and then eventually save up that deposit and, and make the move. Something else we always hear of when it comes to purchasing property is location, location. Location. Exactly. Yeah. Is that a typical mistake often made? It, a lot because people look at a, at a cheaper place and they think, oh, that's, that's affordable, not, not realizing that it's far from transport routes, it's on the wrong side of the highway, the traffic's terrible, mm. there's not good schools in that area. So there's a lot of research that a, that a person needs to do before they move into a place to make sure that there's, there's good schools if they've got kids, mm. that it's close to a transport route if they're using a, a bus or a um, train, or that the traffic's not too terrible to get to work, that you'd need to leave two hours before just to get to work on time. And because a lot of people view property as an asset, do all those issues that you mentioned also contribute, contribute to the capital appreciation yes, of, of the property? Yeah, so, so an area in a, in a more sought after area will obviously be more expensive to start with, but the capital appreciation is probably more than, than one that's in a less desirable area where no one really wants to live. Mm. Let's talk about this heavyweight bond that uh, unfortunately lasts for about 20, 20 years, even yeah. 30 years for <laughs> some, but 20 years is a very long time and it's highly unlikely that many people actually stay in the same place for that period of yes. time. Are, are there methods in which South African consumers can uh, kind of speed up that pace and reduce uh, the payment period of their bond? Yeah, the best thing to do is to try and pay extra into that bond. How much extra? Well, normally 10% if you can. That, that sort of knocks off four or five years of your bond. So you save a hell of a lot of money on your interest, and then you're obviously saving five years on your, on your, on your repayment term. So you're only paying that bond for 15 years mm -hmm. as opposed to 20. But 10% extra on top of a bond and the other costs with the property is, is also a challenge sometimes. So a lot of our clients just pay the, the minimum that they can for that 20 year period. Uh, any other investment vehicles? Are we finding that maybe some South Africans are taking money out of their investments, putting in lump sums, your bonus maybe into your bond? Yeah, that's a, the, a lot of clients use their bonus to, to knock the bond off. Um, there's always a debate on whether you should pay your property off first or invest in other areas. You know, mm. the repo rate's about 9.25%, so your bond rate will vary anything from 8 to 11 or 12% per annum. If you can get 16 or 17% return in an investment, is it best to tie your money up saving the 9% or making 17%? So that's quite, a, that's quite a decision to make as well. But it is also nice knowing that you've paid your, your primary residence off, that no one can ever come and take it from you. Exactly. So there's two schools of thought that either pay it off quickly and, and just have that peace of mind, or do you save the extra thousand and a month into an, an equity account, for instance, that may do 18 or 19 percent. It may also do negative. So exactly. you may lose some money there, whereas you wouldn't have lost money paying it off of your bond. So, so it goes according to your risk profile? Yeah, it goes as to well your risk profile, you how you feel about your property, you know, if you're going to live there forever, if you want to pay it off and rent it out one day. So you need, you, you need a long-term plan, and mm -hmm. that's what a lot of people don't, don't end up doing, is planning from now until retirement, as opposed to just trying to you know, buy a property and, and try, and, try and afford to pay the repayments. Exactly. You touched on insurance earlier as well, and I think there's a, a bit of confusion on the market when it comes to a lack of consumer education about homeowners insurance and household goods insurance. Yes. Which of the two should be a priority there, or is it both? Well, it's both, but if you, if you can't afford both, the best is the, the actual homeowner's insurance, because that insures your building to, for fire, for damages, um, if anything actually breaks on it, and you're in essence insuring your 800,000 Rand property, mm. whereas your, 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 um, your homeowner's, your goods insurance is insuring the, the content of your house. So if something happens that you get burgled or your, your house burns down, they'll replace your TV, your clothes, that sort of thing. So the, the one's insuring your, your actual assets, your house, mm -hmm. and the other's insuring your consumables. So if you think you could replace those consumables, you, you may not need that insurance, but we always recommend having as, you know, insuring as much of it as, as you can. Because mm -hmm. you don't need a fire to now burn down your house, and you don't have a house, and you've lost all your clothes, your TV, 
et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Otherwise, then you are probably starting off from a more negative position yeah. than what you actually started with initially. Definitely. Let's speak to the pr prospective homeowner, someone who's actually just about to wrap up their bond payment. Uh, the value of your home as an asset and to continue trying to get some kind of a return on that investment by renting it out, is that still an option for them? That is an option. The, the mistake some people make is they think that their primary residence is an investment. And it's actually not because you need to live somewhere. And maintain And it. maintain that and pay all the rates and taxes and, and all the expenses that come with living there. So if you're going to keep it and then buy a second house, mm. that would then make sense to rent out your property because there's no bond in it. Use that rent to possibly uh, pay the shortfall on your, on your new bond. But your actual primary residence is never, must never be seen as an investment. We've seen people cashing in their retirement funds to pay off a property, oh. which is fine because at least you've paid it off. But you need to then know that one day you need to rent that property out to generate an income. While you're still living there, you can't actually access the cash. You can't pay rent to yourself. Yeah, exactly. You can't rent to yourself. Exactly. So it ends up being, being not as much of an investment as people think it is. Before we go, maybe it's just time to wrap up as to the key considerations that uh, consumers need to look out for before making this big purchase of their first home. So the first one is the affordability. Secondly is knowing that you're going to pay that bond for 20 or 30 years. So it's a very long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. If you default two or three months, the bank's going to be on your case. Um, you need to make sure that you buy in an area that suits you, that's convenient and as best of a location as, as you can afford and then that it must be close to a transport route and a school route. I think those are the two, the two main, main objectives when you're buying a place, if you've got kids and if you need to work in a CBD or something like that. Location, location, location. Goes all the way back to location. Exactly. Graham, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights Pleasure. with us. Well, that's where we leave it for personal finance this evening. A big thank you to Graham Knight from Alexander Forbes. Do remember that we want to hear from you, so send us your tweets, your comments and suggestions to at CNBC Africa using the hashtag finance410 or even to myself at kukumfupi. Until next time, though, it's goodbye for now.